Hello, welcome along to WD18, the Watford fan channel with myself, Jacob Colshaw, Charlie Zazera. Charlie, how are you, mate? Before we introduce our special guest. I'm good, I'm good. A bit disappointed with that last gasp United goal, but um, it is what it is. Um, and yeah, still, I quite enjoyed yesterday's game. I'm looking forward to talking about it, especially with Piero, um, getting like a coach in, uh, a coach's perspective on it. But yeah, not too bad, mate. Top man, top man. So as Charlie says, we're going to be reviewing yesterday's defeat at home to Leicester with a very special guest, uh, a former Hornet as a player, a current Hornet as a coach, Piero Mingoya, joining us on the show today. Piero, how are you getting on, mate? What a pleasure to have you on. Evening, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm all well, thank you. Uh, I hope you're all well. Top man. Uh, do you know what, Piero, my, uh, when, when Charlie said we've, we've got you on today, my first thought with you at Watford was in that birder kit. You know, and it was the sponsor and also the uh, kit manufacturer as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is there a sort of uh, is there a, is there a sort of moment that stands out for you from your time at Watford? Just as a player, before we get onto your time at the club as a coach so far. Yeah, well, the, the standout one is obviously um, scoring on my debut at Vicarage Road. That's obviously kind of what you dream of when you you're coming through some sort of academy system and getting to the first team, playing, uh, and then ended up scoring a goal in, in the debuts, you, you can't complain. Um, but Watford, for me, as a player, was kind of an education, really. Um, I was there from 13 to, to 21, the whole academy system, then a few years as a pro. Very fortunate that time. Um, we didn't really know at the time that we worked with some pretty good coaches who now are some of the best coaches and football people in, in the country. So, yeah, some some very good experiences that, that helped me not only in, have a football career, um, but also bits that I've taken on in, in life and in how to conduct yourself and, and things like that. Sure. Former professional football player and obviously, as I said, under-15s coach at Watford at the moment. How's that been, mate, uh, getting into your coaching career with the badges and stuff? What What's life been like at, at the club as a coach? Brilliant, mate. It's uh, it's very addictive, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you that. And I hear, I've heard people talk about people older than me that maybe started coaching before me and I didn't think it was for me when I was playing, uh, maybe because I was just so consumed by football. Um, but when I come out, I had, had a, look, li sorry, a little look around and I thought I tried it. And then, yeah, you kind of just get the bug and just ded dedicating yourself to help people get better. Um, it, it's very satisfying, um, but you, it, you need to kind of give it everything. I don't think it's a role that you can kind of pick and choose in and out. Um, you, you need to dedicate yourself to it. And like, I'm on my, on my A licence at the moment. Um, so doing the badges, doing the experience on the grass, just just trying to do the right things to give yourself a chance to to help the people you're working with, and also maybe trying to progress it in in your own career. Love that. Love I was that. just going to ask Pierre, what play the players that you played with at Watford? I think you had John Eustace, even Deeney now is got to be a head coach. Um, did you think all of those guys would go on to be managers? I mean, Eustace has got in a Blackburn now. Has there been any of else you played with? Um. There from that Watford team, um, the main ones, I believe. Ross Jenkins is, I think, should be still manager of Oxford City in the National League, and he got him promoted. And um, he was more someone kind of closer to my age that I grew up with. Um, but John Eustace, yeah, you could probably see it because obviously he was he was a captain at the time, uh, like a, a real leader of men. Um, and even Troy at the time, he was he was younger, obviously kind of new new to the club. Um, he went on to do some great stuff for Watford, but you could see he had um, he had a passion for football, and he you could see he just had something that he wanted to be a leader, um, and I, he obviously become that at Watford. Um, when when I moved on, I, I followed it, and yeah, so now he wants to to give it a go as a manager, and yeah, hopefully it goes well for them. We're going to throw a few more questions over to Pierre about his, his time at Watford, uh, not only as a player, but as a coach later on in the show. So make sure you do stick around, leave a like on the stream, subscribe to WD18 and follow the guys on their social channels. The link is in the description below. Uh, on to yesterday, Charlie. 2-1 defeat at home to Leicester. Uh, I wanted to take it actually before the game, even before the team lineup. Uh, Val's pre-match press conference, was, which was getting a lot of, lot of attention because of how honest and open he was about this Watford team and how we are in a bit of a transition period at the minute, the amount of young players we're playing, the amount of things that he's had to change in such a short period of time. What did you make of it? Because from my perspective, it felt like he was maybe managing expectations slightly after a little bit of a rocky, rocky run of form. Um, yeah, what, what was your what was your take on what he said in that press conference initially? 
Yeah, I thought it was really refreshing. I remember we spoke in the group chat and we kind of said, what do we think of this? Um, and we said we thought it was brilliant how refreshing he was. And like you said, I think he was managing expectations and just saying what the reality is with Watford at the moment. We've got so many young players who are new to it. We know young players are going to be inconsistent. Um, and obviously we're going through a bad run of form at the moment. Um, and yeah, he's just saying what the reality is, where we are at the moment. We need to get everyone back to full fitness. But I just, again, I'm liking Val as the days go by. And I thought it was a really honest, direct, kind of punchy uh, press conference and just kind of managing expectations. But yeah, I was really impressed with it. Yeah, I, I thought it set the tone as well, especially there was a lot of chat. I mean, look, I'm not saying online's the metric of the whole fan base opinion, but there were a few moans, I think, after after which result was it, Charlie? It was, we had Leicester. Um, South, Southampton midweek. Southampton midweek. Obviously, we lost to Cardiff. There was a few grumbles maybe about about this Watford team. Anyway, we're going to go into yesterday, uh, Piero. Um, what was your thoughts on what was your thoughts on the starting lineup? There was a lot of talk about Ryan Andrews not starting, and as someone who's come through the academy as well, managing young players in this team, how difficult is that for Ishmael? Because he's mentioned a lot about playing like the likes of Esprit at eighteen, Andrews at nineteen, even the likes of James Morris, who's twenty two. Ishmael Kone is a young player. We forget that. What have you made of the way Ishmael's managed this squad so far since he's come to the club? I'm I'm a fan of the manager, to be honest. Um, I don't have no no inside information of I see what you see, the way he's interviewed, stuff like that. And whenever he speaks, I, I always kind of I think he speaks very well, uh, very assured in it in himself and his his kind of methodologies of, of football and coaching. Um, so I think he's he's a, he's a good man to have in place at the moment for Watford. Um, coming down to young players, it's a difficult one because. You want to squeeze, especially if they're, they've got ability, you want to squeeze every ounce of them. All the fans want them out there all the time. But bodies uh, and kind of mentally, sometimes they, they need to just take a little step back, um, refresh and, and then come again to go to go stronger. Um, but I understand people want to see kind of, especially homegrown players, they want to see them all the time. Um, but I think we've seen some big cases in, in football worldwide of some young players playing almost too much football at young ages and it, it come back to bite them later on in their career. So, yeah, I do think you have to try and control your emotions and, and look, at, look at it logically um, and see where they're at and, and kind of pick and choose their moments. Sure. Piero, did you have that when you were playing, such an emphasis on load and managing that kind of... Because it just seems Val's very, like, by the book in terms of he's going to play a certain amount of minutes, like whether it's 60 minutes... We've, we've seen about Dennis coming in. There's a massive fanfare wanting him to start, but I think he's getting his minutes in training and just getting more and more minutes until he can start. Did you have that emphasis when you were playing? I think just as a general at the moment in football, there is much more emphasis on that sort of things. Um, we we had GPS and, mm. and all the data and stuff, um, but now it really is kind of more influential. The sports science is definitely having more power in, in kind of the the meetings and stuff around football, just in general, you can see that they've got a big impact on on training and, like you say, load for minutes. Um, if they've got the data and it's showing that someone's higher risk to injury, uh, uh, you'd be br pretty brave to kind of risk it and then for it to go wrong. Like, for example, uh, Crystal Palace, I think was Eze the other day, mm -hmm. or Elise, sorry, Elise, when he, he came on, risked it, and he, he kind of went again. And so, yeah, it's, it's that... Are you going to risk the short-term gain to then lose them for for a longer period? Uh, and if you don't have the biggest of squads, I don't think you can take that risk. Yeah, that's the thing with the Watford squad, Charlie. I mean, you look at the team yesterday uh, with Andrews on the bench. Deli Bashiri came in at right back. Just just your thoughts and thoughts on that lineup, because I mean, we'll touch on the game in just a moment. Bay Bayo coming off on a minute, etc. <laughs> so there was a lot. There was a lot to play with, but we know how Leicester are going to play. We know they're going to play under Maresca, and it is that sort of really brave possession-based football. Maybe not at their fluent best yesterday, but just, sorry, just going, I've digressed there. What On, on the lineup, up Deli Bashiri at right, but there was a little bit of anxiety around that decision before the game started. Yeah, and understandably to a point, because sometimes we've seen him defensively might not be as strong as, as Ryan. Um, as soon as I saw his at right back, I looked at Leicester's lineup because I thought, is um, Matt... Is it Mavadini? Who, who, Stefan Mavadini has been playing, and it, 
I've seen him run at many a right back, and I'm like, oh god, it could be a, could be a long day for Tom uh, today. But he wasn't playing, and to be fair, I thought all in all, Tom had a pretty pretty good game. Um, I think his biggest skill set is his composure on the ball, and we've seen many times where he takes it in tight areas. You've seen him inverted comfortably, um, but I thought defensively he didn't have too much to worry about. Um, I think that that might have helped with the opposition a bit, but. I think fair play to him for his performance yesterday. Um, and I can see why Val's trusting him. Um, we did see Andrews come on and Andrew played in a brilliant pass for Dennis, who maybe should have scored. But um, I think like with the small squad, we've got Jeremy and Gakia coming back. Um, so yeah, that right back, I think Tom's done well, but I can see why fans are kind of frustrated in terms of having a bit of a weak area um, at that right back position. I think the most impressive thing about that pass you said with Andrews was that the fact that there was a player coming on to him as well. And I think if he had actually messed that up, he was the last man. So he had to get that spot on and he did. Charlie, do you want to just run through the the stats from yesterday? So we kind of get a pick overall picture. We know obviously the main the main stat, which is the scoreline, but sort of the momentum bar. <laughs> we can maybe maybe touch on the XG possession shots, big chances, etc. Yeah, so get the trusty m- m- momentum bar out. Um, and when I was trying to analyse the game and especially looking at the clips, I was like. They didn't seem, it felt like we played well, but there wasn't too many positives to take from it. But if you look at the momentum bar, it shows that pretty even, if not Watford majority kind of were the bigger threat. I do think it's important to emphasise that Leicester weren't at it. They weren't at their best um, yesterday. That's why I'm a bit disappointed because I felt there was a bit of an opportunity. Um, and then if you do look at the stats, obviously Leicester had the penalty, which is why their XG is a lot bigger than ours. compared to 1.09. Possession, interestingly, um, Leicester did have more possession, but um, I think we've had the third or or fourth highest possession against Leicester this season. I think it was Southampton, Sunderland and Coventry who when Leicester had 10 men. So it showed that compared to normal teams, we were actually quite dominant against Leicester. And I think that comes down to our approach, which we'll get on. But then you look at the shot stats, we had 13 shots to their six. Both had three shots on target. Um, big chances, 2-2. Two, two. Um, and then I thought shots inside the box, we had six to their three. Um, so in terms of kind of the actual headline stats, we I thought we um, did pretty well. Piero, what did you make of it when you kind of watched the highlights back? Yeah, uh, like I think the, the early goal... Um, probably changed, I'd imagine, the way Watford wanted to set up, um, and kind of kind of rips up your your plan really because at one 0 it's a different game. At their place, Watford decided to kind of like you say, most teams just sit in, um, don't kind of jump out, and because that's what they want you to do. They want you to go press the ball so then they can find space. And to be honest, at their place, I think it worked pretty well for most of the game. Um, it's just maybe tired legs. We we couldn't maybe stuck threatened them with the odd attack when the first half we did. Um, so I do think the goal, the early goal changed a lot yesterday. But like I say, those stats um, are very positive for Watford against a team that, that's high flying, just come down from the Premier League. So wage bills and, and players and stuff are completely out of, the, out of this world with, compared to the rest of the league. And I, I thought they kind of, they had it out yesterday with them. And, and I think that's a positive to take. Just do you think the, if, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, mate. Do you think if they did, we didn't concede the early goal, we would have been a bit more conservative? Possibly, just because of the way that we set up at their place. Um, and when we say conserv- conservative, we don't mean just sitting back and just taking taking pressure. It's kind of just allowing no gaps uh, and no space to then allow players like uh, Semo and Martins and, and Bayo to kind of open up their legs and exploit their their spaces when they maybe they're really open at the back, um, just because I, I felt like it it worked pretty well for the majority of the game in Leicester. Um, so I thought maybe it would have been a similar idea. On to yesterday, um, Piero. You mentioned that game at the King Power where the the setup was pretty obvious, as you say, to kind of not kind of suffer without the ball, keep it as compact as possible, make it as difficult as possible for Leicester. And as you say, we managed to get it up to, I think it was the 76th minute before Vardy scored the penalty and then, as uh, Vardy scored and then scored the penalty later on. On to yesterday, one thing that I spotted, Piero, was the way that Val clearly told 
Paul Chiss and Hoot to step out either onto Drewsbury Hall or to one of the other midfielders. What do you think the thinking was behind that, just from a tactical point of view? Um, from yeah, from 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 a tactical point of view on that, because it was very clear, particularly Porteous was going out and trying to get as tight as possible to to Drewsbury Hall. Something I remember from the first game is Drewsbury Hall was getting the ball loads in between kind of the midfield and the back line, um, and kind of he was causing a lot of problems. So I imagine it, it's just that, just just kind of go tight of him. I don't think Drewsbury Hall really run away from you in behind, um, so you can probably take that that gamble with him of go tight, even if he does skip past you. He, he might be a bit quicker than you, but he's not going to kind of leave you leave you for dead. Um, so sometimes you'd rather that just go up against him, kind of don't let him turn, which obviously that's what he wants to do and, and find passes. Yeah, just get someone up against him and kind of try and force them back. And if they do go in the space, then back yourselves to kind of to deal with it. Charlie, I guess there's pros and cons to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to get some screen grabs up now. Um, if I can find my window, where are we? That was my that was my segue. I was like, Piero explained it, and then Charlie can give us the deep dive. <laughs> Get the screen grabs up and go full Gary Neville. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt it anyway. Um yeah, I wanted to ask something in terms of that man marking, and it's interesting what Piero said about the game plan changing after the early goal, because obviously we've got to we've got to go for it now. Um and looking back, like you said, Jacob, and I think you tweeted it before the game about Porto, Porto coming in and yeah. some fans are moaning about that approach but Wesley Hoot sometimes was as aggressive as well um, but, the, but the one like if you look at this first goal or the penalty from Leicester it's, it's the man marking that I wanted to ask Piero about um, and you can see here um, Livermore's passed on um, who's their young lad who, who's gone running in um, let's get... McAteer I think yeah McAteer um, yeah so if you look over here, the ball's getting moved on and Livermore's kind of passed him on. And you can see here it's Chat Fidazzi in the in the left back position. And I think that's when that's when we're in trouble. Um and then here you go, Chat Fidazzi, and then it's a one on one. Um and then it could have been a penalty. It's that man marking um that didn't work for us for two occasions. It did work on a couple of times. I think the pros and cons are if we can win it high. We've got loads of people in their area, but it didn't work on this occasion. That's why Chat Fidazzi was kind of in this left back spot. Um, Jacob, I don't know if you've seen it back. Did you think it was a penalty? It was one of those. If it was the other end of the pitch, I want a pen, but I thought it was soft, if I'm honest. Uh, I, I watched it on a few different angles. I also think, and Piero will know better than me, you can kind of gauge whether it's a penalty based on the player's reaction as well. I don't mm. think there was a lot of complaints from Georgie when it got given, if I'm honest. And I think the sign that it wasn't a penalty or if he, there wasn't any contact, the players would be going crazy. Obviously, Hoot's going to go up to the referee and get in his face. But I thought Georgie's reaction was quite telling. I'm not saying there was loads of contact. There was probably enough for a penalty. And I think if it was the other way around, I'd be wanting a penalty as well. So, yeah, it, I think the thing is for me there, though, Charlie, if you just look at Lewis, where he ends up out there, obviously, He's Georgie's good. had to fill in at, at left back. Is that... That that we mentioned Hoot and Porteous, but it's it's clear that Lu, I don't know whether that was intended, but Lewis has just followed their winger into the into the centre. I, I I think I don't know. I'll ask Piero. Do you think this is a man marking approach out of possession? I'm not too sure to be honest. I think sometimes it could be just you don't have time to maybe communicate to each other um, about kind of swapping over or let, taking over someone else's man, so you just end up going with him. Mm. Um, and if someone's decided to go with them, then you've got to kind of just see that and maybe fill a gap. Um, so I wouldn't be able to tell you if it's a a straight tactical approach. It could just be someone's gone all the way um, and there's been no time to kind of communicate to exchange players and you just stay in your space and let them run onto you. And yeah, you could kind of just, you deal with the situation in hand. So just getting the pen out. I've just, this was the second goal. Um, and this is how the move starts off. They're playing out the back building and we've got one, two, sorry, Semmer's got lost there. Three, <laughs> four, these are rubbish lines. Five. This, this is not exactly uh, Monday Night Football, is it? <laughs> Sam, you go, this is your fault. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, seven players. Up the pitch. Go, and I'm guessing... 
the approach is we want to get up high. If we win the ball back, we've got seven players in the half and we should we should have a high chance scoring. But what happens is Leicester, with the players they got, Leicester with the players they've got, move it around and then it turns into a one, two, three, four, a five V three with Porto running back. Um, Jacob, do you think we should have gone that bold and that aggressive or do you think we should have maybe sat back a bit more? I think it's a different conversation home and away. I think when you're away from home, you can probably be allowed to have less of the ball and maybe suffer a little bit more. I think it's probably, it's harder as well. I think personally, if you went away from home, I almost expect us to concede a lot of the ball and just say, look, Leicester, if we can, if we can make it as difficult as possible and then maybe, maybe, maybe nick a goal on the breaker from a set piece. I don't mind this, to be honest. I, I kind of expected it as well. I think some teams had got quite a lot of joy from being aggressive and it's the risk and reward that you guys went go back to as well. On the one hand, yeah, OK, look, we've lost the game. On the other hand, I actually thought we probably could have nicked the point on another day. So I don't think that was actually the the end of the world. I was frustrated with the second goal, though, personally, because I understood the the plan with it. But as soon as you broke that first line of the press, I mean, there was just a massive gap in the midfield. And I don't think you can really allow that. I guess what happened there, and correct me if I'm wrong, Piero, but Livermore and Porteous have basically gone to the same man. It's then left someone behind Livermore. I don't know which player it was. But even then, on the transition, it felt that we did have a chance to get to get the ball back. And if Porteous maybe hadn't gone to ground, you never know. But what did you make of that second goal, Piero? Because it was quite frustrating from my end. Yeah, I saw it. And it was just kind of people coming out kind of really fast, um, maybe not organised behind them. Yeah. Um, so then obviously there's a lot of space if they if they do pass it around you. Uh, and like we said, that's what teams nowadays, um, some of the best teams, they want you to just, they want to bait you out, out of your pocket and then they'll they'll go and find it. Um, and that goal probably literally just was, was perfect for them. But like I say, I think sometimes people maybe just come out a little bit too quick. Um, and I'm not sure kind of the manager would want it like that. I'm sure he probably wanted it a bit more organised, but sometimes... Like someone might get frustrated or something and just get a little bit angry and, and go on the press by themselves and then all of a sudden there's there's gaps to gaps to exploit and and Leicester did in that occasion and it was a for their from their side a, a pretty good goal. Yeah, I mean you flip it the other way around as well, uh, Charlie. Jordy makes a great comment. Pressing like that did lead to one of their goals, but it also led to one of ours. I've got no problem with the pressing. So it... my, my only issue with that, like I was gonna try and like wangle that as a good, oh look at this high press. But I think let's have it right. Harry Winks has had an absolute shocker to to gift us a goal. <laughs> I don't think I don't think it was a that much of a great organised press that that led to Dennis's first. Just on that goal, I mean, look, I didn't expect it to be honest. I felt that not Leicester and Cruz control, but you kind of felt the game was going one way in that respect. And when it goes to two 0 it's it's difficult. But I have to say that I, to be fair, you say about the press though, Charlie. The setup was good. Hmm. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it forced it, but certainly it meant that we were in the position to score. If that makes sense, I know we, we went man man marking. Georgie was quite quick on the on the press. Dennis was in the right position. Look, maybe it's not a press because it came from a goal kick, but the, the actual setup I thought was pretty good. Yeah, and I think uh, straight after that goal, we had a chance from really good pressing that they kind of tried to build up from the back and couldn't, and it kind of got the crowd up. And I felt like on though Bow made those changes. Was it Dennis Espria and? Uh, Andrews, I think that was mm. on 60 minutes. And then I think for like the next 10 minutes, the momentum was really with us. And I thought, could we go on to get an equaliser here? Um, those subs are really likely. I wanted to mention kind of Espria's performance, who was central again. I'm really liking him central. I think he's doing a lot more good work centrally. There was a move where he got the ball, kind of made a really incisive pass to Kone, who again flicked on and it should have been like a Dennis one and one and it kind of fell to Ince who hit it over. I'm not too sure. I don't know how, not rigid isn't the word, but how strict Val is in terms of having this shape of a 4-3-3. Three, three. But I would like to see a spree more centrally. What do you reckon? I always thought his best play was when he drifted inside. I mean, Piero, your time as a winger, did you ever play inverted? Did you, were you ever told by the manager to come inverted? And what's what's the difference between keeping your width and maybe going to the byline and then cutting inside, what what tactically do you have to change about your game? Yeah, so uh, when I was coming through at Watford, I was I mainly played on the left wing. Um, so obviously I would kind of cut in and I had um, one of my mates was a attacking fullback, so he would overlap and 
we would we'd, we would play that combination. And as I got old, older and played kind of first team football uh, in the EFL, I ended up being more of a, a right winger, keeping my width and kind of getting one on one and getting crosses into the box. I think the the going inside is just to kind of to tee, to give the fullback a, a decision to make. Uh, you're going to come in uh, with me and you leave space for someone else, or you're going to stay out there and I'll be able to get the ball kind of centrally, obviously more focused towards towards hurting the opposition in the kind of the heart of the defence instead of out wide and you've got to work your way in. If you receive it in that pocket, all of a sudden you're threading people kind of through to, to goal. This is the thing though with the spree, Charlie, because I, I always think, as Pierre said, when you've got a player drifting inside, we know he's he's predominantly left-footed. He rarely goes down the right, which I think maybe limits him slightly and probably why we have to play him on the right because he cuts in, Andrews then has the run around the side and we all know what he's like when he gets going. I guess the great thing about the 10 roll is you then don't know which way a spree is going to go. It's a bit more unpredictable. I feel like when you play him on the right, we all know he's going to cut in. It's very rare he goes on the outside. So I actually quite like the fact that he, he plays in that sort of number 10 because it gives him the freedom to drift into those pockets and and create a little bit more. But his chance creation is like one of the highest for us this season, though. Yeah, I, I, I liked what we did against Cardiff when we were chasing the game. I think we went to a 4-2-3-1 with, I think it was Livermore and Kone as the, as the double pivot, the Spreer as a 10. Um, and I'm not sure if that could work more for us. But I think now we've got Dennis, obviously Bayo has pulled up, which is actually quite a bad, it, it's, it could be a bad injury for us in terms of depth, but I just want to see some chaos now. I think with Dennis on the pitch, I just want to see a fluid front line. Um, if we can create space for Dennis, he's gonna he's gonna be good enough to finish. We just I think we need to be a bit more chaos, and we need our quick attackers in that front line moving constantly, being a headache. Because I I know Val likes a bigger target man. I don't think we can rely on Ryevich for that. So. For the next game, I remember tweeting ages ago asking about Martins as a false nine. Could you have a spree? Could you, Dennis played centrally yesterday, but I'd much rather go for more of a chaotic, dynamic front line than try and get Rayovic and, and build off him. Mark says the things we do have Semmer, Martins, Ince, and Dennis who can play wide so we can afford to play a Yasser inside in the middle. Um, should we touch on Rayovic, uh, Charlie? Because he, he came on after the first minute for Bayo. He then got subbed off again. Uh, for Dennis, if I remember correctly. It's a weird one, isn't it? Because he, he he's... A, he, I don't know if I'd say splits opinion, Rybic, because I feel like more people aren't really back in his corner than back in it, if that makes sense. There's two sides to it. On the one hand, he's a guy who's a box striker. He needs the service. And a lot of the time, he doesn't get maybe the ideal service for, the, for his strength. But there's also other stuff he does that he could be doing a lot more, if that makes sense. Like, you, you look at his off-the-ball work, you think, can he bring other play, people into play with his hold-up play? Where do you stand on that again? Because it's one that we've touched a lot on this channel, but it feels like something's just missing. It just isn't really clicking. I know he went on that run where he was scoring a lot of goals in the box and he's. we knew what we were going to get when we signed him after you spoke to some people who watched a lot of him. But it just feels like he's lacking some of the attributes needed to be a, a complete striker in the EFL. Yeah, I just don't think it's working because I just don't think it's suited at the moment. I said yesterday at half-time, with Rivic, we need to put crosses on like... Lewis needed to do better wide, putting crosses on. Ken, I think, put one really good cross in and it almost led to an own goal off Val uh, fast. And I think Rajevic was in the great good position there. His movement's actually really good off the ball, but we're not putting enough of those crosses in for him to attack. Um, and I just don't... I think there was a point yesterday where we were defending and he was trying to press and he was kind of next to next to one of their players that like so close and I think he was worried about his position just a bit confused but I don't know, Piero what's your when you were a player and you're playing with a target man what do you expect from them do you expect them just to be in that in that box to score goals are you looking for them to press are you looking for them to link up or, or does it depend for each striker and all what system you're playing I think it depends for each striker, but I do think if you are playing up front by yourself um, and you're not necessarily playing with a full kind of total football team that are going to get it regularly into your feet um, in areas that you want it, I do think you need to hold it up. Um, that would be, uh, for a striker that I played with, it would be a, a key attribute because um, he just, I've got one in mind that I played with, he just brought in the three behind, he just brought them all into play. Um, he's kind of like the bounce board that you that gets you up the pitch and allows you to play. And 
when I didn't play with a striker that could hold it up, it was, I found it very kind of difficult to get into the game as a winger um, because then one supply, one service supply isn't there anymore and you're basically just relying on, on like your fullback giving you the ball um, instead of being able to make different movements because you know your, your striker's going to hold it up. Um, one thing with Ryavich, which I don't think you can complain about, is that he gets goals in the box. Um, so I don't think that's the worst kind of attribute to have. And it's his first year in England um, in the Championship, which is unforgiving league. So I'm sure he's learning loads. And if he just kind of takes it all on board, I'm sure he'll, he'll add what he needs to his game to kind of to make him uh, valuable for the club. But like you say, you get crosses into the box, he, he, he's proved that he, he gets goals. So mm -hmm. that's not the worst kind of attribute to have and, and build on the rest. Yeah, agreed. I think when his goals dry up, that's when the questions come come around a bit more, Charlie. It's it's it, it's pretty pretty ruthless, isn't it? I mean, when he was going on that run of of scoring as many as he as he was, he was on a great run. I remember. Even then, people were saying, "Oh, is he offering more than just away from the goals?" But then, obviously, you can't argue with the fact that his job is to score goals as a striker, and he, he was delivering it when they've dried up. And I think it's like one in the last ten, if I'm not mistaken. Then people are starting to question his his all round game. Um, so, so we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But I, I do think Bio is a. We, I've said it quite a few times this year. I think Bio is the better option for us in terms of defensively as well. We go back to what we said about the pressing and the shape. I feel off the ball, Bio gives you a bit more than than Rivic, But then if flip it on the other way, Rivic is probably a better finisher than Bio. So each their own. The last player I wanted to touch on before we just touch on the overall thoughts on the performance very briefly was just Tom Deli Bashiru, Charlie at right back. We mentioned at the top of the show about the team selection. It was the one uh, position that I think a lot of Watt fans were a little bit worried about because I think it was Preston away when he played right back. I felt that he was getting targeted quite a bit. There was another game where he was getting targeted quite a bit as well. But how did you how did you assess his overall performance? Because we know it's not it's natural for Tom at all, but I guess it does give us the option of a player drifting into the middle and supporting the midfield. Yeah, like I said at the start, I thought he, I thought he was pretty decent. I thought we didn't have too much to defend. I think his composure is his biggest strength. I think he's been really good. Like I think on the whole, he's been great this season. I think sometimes you see him driving at, at the defence and I think maybe he would be wanting to play in that midfield and there's a case for that. Georgie Chapfordatsi didn't have the most impactful game. He had a chance in the middle. I thought Kone was pretty bright again. But I think one player that we're missing is probably Kayembe. Again, just to have that composure and that calmness in the middle to kind of link things together and slow play down when we need to. It's going to be interesting. I don't think he's near coming back yet, so we're going to have to wait. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what we do against Norwich. What, who, who do you want to see play against Norwich? I touched on the front line. Do you think Rovic should start against Norwich? Any other players you want to see come in? Well, I think the thing is with 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 the strike situations, we don't know how long Bayo is going to be out for. So, if you're looking at sort of a natural number number nine, then I think we have to play have to play Rivic. Having said that, where do I see Dennis fitting in this team? You know, I still don't think he's probably ready for a full ninety. From what Val's been saying in the press conferences, it feels like he's seeing him more as a winger. If I'm honest, I felt yesterday he came on because he had to. But I always thought, or well, I, I do think that Val sees him more of a left winger cutting in. Um, from from the left hand side, so I'd like to see Dennis involved a little bit earlier on, and whether that's starting him and then bringing him off early, that might be the way. But I guess there's an argument to say he gets has more of an impact off the bench at the moment until he until he's fully fit. I think the one player we are missing, and I don't know when he's going to be back, but I do think Kayembe makes such a difference to this team. You know, he gives us that control in the midfield. That's nothing against Chatfordetsi, but he's a runner. And Kone's a runner as well. And when you have Livermore, it kind of left him. I felt yesterday a little bit isolated in the middle. Whereas Kayembe is a little bit of both. He mm. brings that sort of control on the ball, but he can also beat a man. So I think the sooner he's back, that will be a bit of a game changer. And just, just on that midfield dynamic, Piero, what do you think our best three is? Because I've said it, that Livermore is almost a guaranteed starter. A lot of people at the club have said the ceiling for Kone is really high. Do you see Kayembe as that third one or, or Georgie is more of an option? Or do you think it depends on the opponent we're playing? I think... Uh either to be honest because I've seen it work with with um, Livermore, Kayambe and Kone and I've seen it work with with uh, Chak Vatadze as well so yeah it's, it's difficult when when someone's missing and maybe someone doesn't have kind of the best of games automatically you think ah oh, we need he needs to be back and and that's the case sometimes but 
Kone, for me, I, I've, I've really enjoyed watching him uh, at times this season. Uh, and he's really young. So, yeah, like you say, there's people at the club saying the ceiling's pretty high. I'd, I'd agree. And Livermore, I think the stability of the team changed when Liverpool uh, Livermore came in. I think it was come the away game. Um, Cardiff, um, maybe? Yes. I think it was his first start. And, and the team just looked a lot more solid with him there. Just someone who knows how to play that role. Um, obviously knows um, the championship pretty well. And you can just tell he just he knew where to be at, at any given time. And he doesn't do anything kind of crazy, but he's very effective. And then he started to add a, a couple goals here and there. So, yeah, yeah I, think, I think he's had a really strong season. For sure. Just lastly, thoughts on um, the overall performance, Charlie? Just sort of how you're feeling coming away from it? Yeah, I thought it was pretty positive. Like, I thought the application was bang on. Um, you can see all the stats there of the shots that we've been putting in. So against the league leaders, I think that I just came away with a bit of um, a bit of disappointment because I thought there was an opportunity there. There's, it's not very often you're going to play teams like that when they're not going to be kind of full strength and at it. Um, I wanted to shout out Wesley Hoot as well. For me, he's been our player of the season and I thought, I thought he was great yesterday, even with his aggressive defending coming out. He, he won so many... So many balls high up the pitch. His passing, his passing's back to his best. He had a, he had another long range shot which uh, troubled the keeper. Um, I think he's been absolutely mustered this season. Um, for me, player of the season. Be interesting. I know it's a bit of a bit of a debate, but interesting to see what people say in the comments about who our player of the season is. But for me, it's Wesley who El Capitano. Who do you reckon, Piero? Yeah, I think he's up there. Uh, um, like I say, Livermore. I saw a clear difference in the team when Livermore went in. Um, so I'd put him up there, but I agree. Uh, Hoyt has been, he's been pretty solid and, and on the ball, he, he's, he's very good. He can start off attacks and he's got a great range of passing. Um, so yeah, I think he's really stepped up and kind of led the back line at times. Um, so yeah, I'd agree. For sure. For sure. I think we're just going to wrap it up with a few questions over to Piero, Charlie. So we've got we've got a couple. If there's any in the live chat, let us know and we can we can throw them over to him. Uh, so Piero, just we touched upon it at the start of the show. Uh, what what was it what was it like coming through the academy? I know it was a little while ago now and, and playing for Watford, but just just your overall just your overall memories. And I guess one of the questions is like and people talk about it a lot, but how much has the club changed from when you were playing to to now in terms of the academy setup? <laughs> Yeah, it's it, like coming through was was obviously very difficult, very challenging, like most football academies are um, up and down the country. Um, you got to kind of almost not have the normal kind of teenage years and and those those times that most young boys or, or, or young girls are having uh, at that time. So you got to sacrifice a lot. You um, saying you never know Shiana? <laughs> maybe uh, as I got older. <laughs> as I got older um, but yeah you, you, you have to sacrifice um, like now I see the boys come into training at young ages you, you know they've got school all day and then they're coming giving up their evenings in a way to to try and pursue a dream um, getting home I don't know nine ten o'clock at night and then getting it's you, I, took, I just thought it was normal and then when you kind of you're older and you look back and you, you realise that that's that's not normal and they deserve credit just for that alone um, because they're, they're just trying to give themselves a chance of achieving a dream. Um, so if you can pick up bits along the way, experiences, and if you make it or not, you've developed as a person, developed as a player, and you take it into whatever you go and do, I think that's how you've got to look at academy football. Um, because we all know the stats. They're, they're pretty damning. Um, so it shouldn't be, the journey can't be decided on a, on a, a yes or a no. I think there's a lot more to it. And there's a lot of experiences and kind of mental attributes that you can pick up that can really give you an advantage at a young age compared to compared to your peers who maybe are not exposed to kind of those elite environments. What's been the main message you've tried to give to the players that you're working with, Piero? Maybe not even as a, from a football point of view, more of a life point of view. I, I, for me, it's just kind of, I always say to them, just go out there and just give it everything. As long as you can do that, we can't decide if you're going to play well or you're going to play bad because there's other there's other kind of factors that influence that. But if you can look at yourself and I gave everything in training and stuff like that, if if you get let go or you you get kept on, at least you can look at yourself and think I've done my bit because there's nothing worse. And I had a, 
a football career. At times when you look at yourself and you think, I wish I'd done a little bit more because um, you can't go back in and fix it. So that's the main message. And, and just to, to enjoy it and, and be free because see a lot of boys with a lot of pressure on their shoulders at young ages. And it, it's actually, it's horrible to see. And you're just trying to offload it. We all know what we're here for. We're trying to improve as players and to try and become professionals or become a youth team player. But if you put too much pr pressure on your shoulders, like I, said, I experienced it even as a grown man at first team level, your performances will drop off because there's a fine line between too much pressure and then just enough to kind of keep you on that edge. But if you if it goes into that negative side, it your brain becomes almost like a, a prison and you just become shackled up and you don't play freely and you need to play freely to, to be at your best, I, I believe. Before before we wrap up, I wanted to ask about some of the players that you came through with. Um, tell us a bit about who was in your age group. We had Sean Murray on the channel a couple of months ago. Um, we've had Jonathan Bond. Um, am I right in saying maybe British some longer those guys? Luke 09, maybe? So I my exact age, I had um Lee Hodson. Yeah. Who ended up playing a lot for the first team. Mm. Uh year above, I had Ross Jenkins. Um two years above. A year above Marvin Sordell as well. Um, then Del Bennett. Within a two, three year period each side. There was kind of all those people. Then a bit younger was Sean, um, Adam Thompson, who played a little bit. Who else? Like Luke O'Nine, like you said, Britt. Uh, Gavin Massey was one that played a few times. Jonathan Bond. Um, it was a pretty, well, I'll talk about it now, it was a pretty successful period, that three or four year age gap. There were quite a few people that obviously made their debuts for Watford, some more than others. Mm. Um, but if you look now, most of us ended up having kind of 10 year plus careers in the in the EFL so that's a that's a great achievement because yeah a, a career in the lower league is it's tough um and it, it takes it out of you so some are still playing and to go 10 10 year plus is is an unbelievable achievement because like I say it is it is difficult very yeah. difficult and, and what first team players stand out to you of that time when you broke through I always try to get like a good story out of any guests that we get come on, but <laughs> there were some characters, especially that 2010, maybe 11 season. Um, who, who stood out for you? Who took you under their win and who uh, led you down a bad path? So no, no one <laughs> led me down a bad shame, path. Any good stories <laughs> about? No, no. But um, so you had at that time coming through. You had kind of Adrian Mariapa and Lloyd Doyley, who were kind of obviously the main. Uh, academy kind of stories from the club um, that have kind of been there, done that. So they're always, when you are that kind of player, you always have a bias towards the younger players because you were them at one point. So they automatically kind of just kind of look out for you. Um, John Eustace was, like with me personally, was was brilliant. Um, just a, a really nice guy, looked out for me. I think you just saw a young kid who was just trying his best and sometimes you just kind of, you, you get drawn to them because you think, you know, I'll, I'll give him a chance. Um, Stephen McGinn, who was a younger one, he, he kind of looked out for me. And then looking out for him was Don Cowie, and it was kind of a little chain. Don Cowie would look out for him, and then Stephen McGinn would look out for me because there was like a three, four year gap between each one of us. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and it was the year where kind of Danny Graham was on fire and Marv were on fire. Um, that year, Danny, every time he touched the ball, it, was, it turned into gold. He was, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, but like I say, it was a real good good dressing room of experienced pros who, at the time, because Watford was made up with a lot of youngsters, that they they didn't kind of bat the youngsters away. They integrated them and, if anything, looked out for you. Maybe when you're not even kind of ready to be there, but you're there because maybe the club didn't have the finances and stuff like that. So they kind of gave you a chance. And as a young player, that that's all you can ask for. And it's something that I took out and took on in my journey when I become like an older pro um, or older than some, I always kind of try to look out and protect for, protect the younger players just because of the way I got treated. Love that. Love Serious it. throwback with some of these names, by the way. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, Piero, what a pleasure, mate. Thanks so much for coming on and taking the time out on your Sunday Eve. I know the missus is going to be going to be on you when we finish this. So, uh, mate, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, what's, what's the week like looking for you? Training on Monday? Yeah, so I've got training uh, tomorrow night with the boys. Um, we'll train a few times this week, and I believe we've got Norwich away on Sunday. All the best, mate. Touch so, wood. 
thank you guys all the best for the podcast uh, and hope you, it keeps mate. growing and going well top man charlie what a pleasure and if anything else you want to wrap up with mate Yes, I do. I want to wrap up with uh, the WD18 Cup. I want to announce the 10 teams that we've got going on. And uh, yeah. we've got to get Piero coming down on that day, so we'll send him the invite afterwards. But <laughs> the 10 teams for our charity event on Saturday, the 23rd of March, will be our friends at From the Rookery End, the podcast, uh, our sponsors, Mad Squirrel, uh, the Watford FC staff, um, the charity Watford Trust will have a team as well. The ground staff are going to have a team. Um, Scott Tingley's boys, I think they fancy themselves a bit. Uh, Deanie in a bottle, Lad Speak Out FC, the Northwest Hornets, Soul Survivor Church, and Real Madry. So that's our 10 teams for the tournament. We're oh, going to yeah. tweet that out. Um, so anyone, make sure they, they get involved. Like I said, we want to get as many people down as possible. If any individual players are still really keen, drop us a DM because I'm sure some of these. Some of these teams need a bit of legs, a bit of legs. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really grateful for all the support we've had so far. Um, and hopefully we'll have some announcement in the coming days, weeks of some special guests and some uh, some good raffle and auction prizes. Awesome. Awesome. Make sure if you want to get involved, all the details in the description below and on our socials at WD18Fans. Make sure to follow Charlie, Piero and myself on, on socials as well. Um, our at should be there or in the description below as well. Leave a like on the video, subscribe to WD18. And we will see you in the next one. Take care and I'll be on it.